Picture this. You are left for a specific looking watch that is no longer made. And you realize that in this hobby of collecting watches, all the things that you want out of watch are no longer done in terms of their design, their feel, their look. What do you do? Well, most likely you will go to the vintage watch market and search for these watches. And then you come to realize that you'll have to spend a small fortune to get them. And that is where Imperial watches come into play. Ben, the owner of the company, who is based out of Oahu, had launched his company using the experience he had accumulated from modifying and customizing his own watches in the past. He had a basis for modifying Seiko SKXs, and using that knowledge, he decided to launch his own watch company, realizing that as much as he adored vintage watches, it's just a very challenging and daunting task to chase after these vintage watches that are no longer made, extremely expensive, and a nightmare to get parts for. So what we see here is the Ocean Guard GMT, a combination of the company's learnings from the first watch release, the Royal Guard 200, which is their dive watch you see on the right. And it's rare that I have a company that will reach out to me and offer up review watches for me to check out, only for me to realize I really like this watch release to the extent that I voted with my own money and decided to place my own order for one soon here as they come to release. Now the Ocean Guard GMT will be releasing on April 9th, and that's part of the reason why I decided to place an order for one coming soon, as there will only be 25 of these releasing. Just like the Royal Guard 200, it was in limited numbers, and they sold out very quickly. Part of that was the widely positive reception within the watch community as an enthusiast-focused watch release. Ben took the feedback of the local watch community in several forums in designing this watch, and also making the improvements that we would say it is a very complete watch today. Another reason why I was drawn to the watch is how it reminds me of the great watches of yesteryears. We have here a Dorset Dive Watch, which is a watch that was based off of the Walbrook Skin Diver, and Walbrook cased these watches and sold this design to several department stores who branded the watches to their own likeness. That would be the Sears Company, the Dorset Company, and it had all the hallmarks of a great skin diver watch. It's got a very similar handset with the sword hands and that prominent arrow minute hand, along with a lollipop seconds hand that just matches the indices and covers it symmetrically, just perfectly. It's a delight to take a look at in terms of its overall balance proportions, and it's just a really good looking design, in my opinion. This is rather similar to what large brands like Tudor have done, looking back into the vintage catalog and releasing watches with a modern flair. And so, you see here with the Ocean Guard GMT, it has a box sapphire crystal surrounded by an aluminum bezel insert, a coin edge bezel surround, uh, a crown guardless case, an oversized crown, and a very solid jubilee bracelet. It even comes with a charming travel pouch that resembles a passport case with enough space for an air tag, your tools to change straps, your watch, and a few cards. Just talk about how you sell an experience and you really give that feeling and attention detail that I know and come and love about micro brand watches. The ability to track secondary and third time zones is complete with a bi-directional rotating bezel that we have on the Ocean Guard. It is quietly dampened with a bit of resistance so that it will not be bumped on its own. I really do appreciate how Imperial watches invest fully into the vintage watch feel and look, and it's evident with that initial Royal Guard 200 watch release of theirs. The bezel has a bit of springy feeling or tension behind it. It's reminiscent of old dive watches in my view. They also went with an unconventional 90 click bezel. It has classic proportions, 38mm wide, 47mm lug to lug length. And when we look at the build quality and construction, you'll note that most of the finishing here is brushed. There is hardly a polished surface aside from the chamfer met at the top of the lugs and on the side of the clasp, which I come to appreciate. Drilled lug holes help with the ease of changing straps, and every component of this bracelet is solid from the end links to the individual links affixed together by pins. No collars, just a very simple pin system. But first we have to talk about the elephant in the room, and that would be the 14mm case thickness, which may be a non-starter to some that just look at numbers on a piece of paper, and I understand that, but most of the case thickness is relegated to the proud sapphire crystal that sits above that coin edge bezel, so you will not feel it nearly as much, and the case design 
is elegant. It's not a complete slab of a watch. I'm going to get some flack for this, but I think this is the best Jubilee bracelet outside of a Rolex Jubilee bracelet done by a micro brand, no less. It has pins that have fixed the links together, but every single link is solid. The end link is completely solid, hardly any movement in it. The clasp measures at 16 millimeters, which is a dramatic taper from the 20 millimeter wide lug at the top of the watch. I think that it's a very good looking Jubilee bracelet at that, being that it's mostly brushed. It is important to note that the Jubilee bracelet here is entirely brushed. The center links are not polished unlike conventional Jubilee bracelets, and this allows for a rather robust feeling bracelet, yet looks refined. Going back to the clasp that has a twin trigger release and a deep relief etched company logo that is the Imperial Watch Crown, it has been done extremely well, and I think that it strikes for a good balance of quality, robustness, and it even has an on-the-fly one link adjustment out, which will aid in summertime when you are wearing this watch and your wrist may expand throughout the day. Uh, I really do think that the bracelet here is one of the watch's strong points. And in fact, I've handled many Jubilee bracelets all the way from Chinese watches, micro brands, to even Rolex GMT Masters, and this is impressive. Flipping the watch around, you are met with a solid case back with the company logo, the Imperial Watch Crown, and three airplanes around the perimeter of the watch for that travel motif. The spring bars used on the watch are relatively thick and met with the solid end links that sit flush with the rest of the case. You do feel like this is a higher quality feeling watch. There has been attention to detail within the elements of the watch where we interface with the most, especially the case and the bracelet. And I have to say, the build quality has been tremendous and I cannot fault the watch in any regard in this capacity. The NH34 movement that's used in this watch is not your conventional traveler's GMT. It's more like an office GMT movement, meaning that the 24 hour hand is adjusted independently of the hour hand as opposed to the opposite way, which also means that when you are going for a date adjustment, the date can also be adjusted independently of the 24 hour hand or the hour hand for that matter. And so this allows for the watch to be more convenient in terms of that date adjustment. If you leave it unwound for some time, pick it up and you need to adjust the time. It isn't as laborious to adjust as compared to a traveler's GMT. I had asked Ben, the owner of the company, why he chose the NH34 movement as opposed to the Miyota 9075. And it boils down to how their initial watch release, the Royal Guard 200 that you see here, had already had the case and architecture and all the fitments for the NH movement, so it made perfect sense for them to go for that movement. The Royal Guard 200 is very different of a watch compared to the Ocean Guard. The Ocean Guard's bracelet is remarkably different to the Royal Guard. First of all, you have a three-piece H-link setup with polished outer sections and brushed center sections met with a stamped steel clasp that is a twin trigger release clasp with about four points of micro adjustment. It has a safety fold-over clasp to keep it secure on your wrist. It is a significantly less solid feeling clasp than you see on the Ocean Guard, and that's where their improvements have been felt and, well, most significantly made, I should say. Solid end links, and it's still, the bracelet is uh, using pins to keep itself together. I'd say that overall, you can feel the improvements here, but I like that degree of separation between the two watches. It shows that there's been thought made in the evolution of these watches. 200 on the left uses green super luminova and it is brighter and lasts significantly longer than the bgw9 loom that's been used on the ocean guard on the right and i think it's because of that design choice the hands are a little bit brighter than the rest of the dial for a layered appearance this has been a design choice i think i could go with a more consistent loom application more loom applied to the dial would have been something i would have preferred for this watch in judging micro brands and the dial quality, we have to be cognizant that they produce in lower volumes, and that is to the advantage where they can maybe spend more time and dedication to getting a dial cleaner and making sure that there are fewer defects. That compared to large scale manufacturers, such as Seiko, for example, that produce watches in the hundreds of thousands to millions, would be one of the points where you go for a micro brand watch. And the Imperial watch set of watches we see here, both the Ocean Guard and the Royal Guard don't disappoint. The handset is relatively clean. There are a few burrs here and there. The GMT hand, however, is sharp. And I do enjoy the fact that at a macro level, we're talking about a two times magnification level. There are really no visible defects I can see within the dial itself. The printing of the indices, the printing of the text itself, of the logo, the hand stack, 
relatively clean, free of any tool marks for the most part. As a disclosure, you may have noticed that there is a dust speck within that last shot. That is on my camera lens, not on the dial. The case finishing on a magnification level of two times, it does hold up. It's not going to blow your socks away, but even the elements of deep etching on the crown, uh, it is done to a good standard. I love that oversized 7.3 millimeter wide crown. It is easy to really use and interface with. The knurling is deep and even that coin edge on the bezel, I've come to appreciate greatly. I think that the overall feel of this watch, it is of a high standard of quality. The uh, 12 o'clock indicator is actually a very handsome AM PM indicator as it's loomed. So if you're wondering why it's a circle, that is for the express purpose of giving you an indication of night and day as well. A very clever design aesthetic. The roulette date wheel, which means that the even numbers are painted in red and the odd numbers are painted in black, with the 6 and 9 also in open numerals, harkens back to the old days, and I was delighted to learn that it's hand printed, hand applied. Even the GMT hand that's painted in red is flawless with no spillage of paint, unlike some, unlike another brand that uses a crown for their logo. You know who I'm talking about. Even the uh, handset has been done quite well on four times magnification. Really, there is hardly anything I can complain about. The printing of the dial at four times magnification, it holds up rather impressively for a watch that's only $500. We then complete the final part of our video today, talking about how the watch wears on my six and a half inch wide wrist. And this is a watch that measures in once again at 38 millimeters wide, 47 millimeters lug to lug length and is about 14 millimeters thick thanks to that sapphire crystal. That is a very proud sapphire crystal at that. Notice that the case profile, it is diminutive. The lugs, they curve just enough so that they don't overextend the extremities of my wrist. It means that if you've got a wrist smaller than seven inches, you're gonna wear this watch just perfectly fine. If you do have a watch larger than seven inches, it will still fit perfectly fine as well. The case is, ergonomic in the sense that it's comfortable, it doesn't get in the way, and it will slide under a cuff just fine as well. In terms of relative comfort, the Royal Guard 200, the predecessor to the Ocean Guard, it wears just about the same. It shares the case dimensions that are identical to the Ocean Guard uh, GMT. And that's where I want to lead off with this video today. If you're keen on getting this watch, if you're an enthusiast that enjoys micro brand watches with the vintage look and feel of the yesteryears, with none of the drawbacks of owning a vintage watch, please check out these watches at their website. The release date is April 9th, and I would encourage you to give them a chance, as I think this was a very impressive watch release from the company. There will be roughly 25 pieces per color variant of this watch available on April 9th. They should move rather quickly. Thank you so much for checking out the video today, and if you enjoyed it, consider subscribing, and I will catch you in the next one.